Hey, would y'all want to do some breathing together before we jump in on this? Like a minute and a half of just doing some belly breath and something together? Mm -hmm. You did? Good. All right. Run, run the point, here. Jeff. R run the point. I'll just do I'll, I'll just do a visual cue. So on the inhale and then the exhale. So we'll go in through our nose, out through our mouth. We'll slow it down. So here we go. Get yourself cozy. Feet underneath you. And breathing in. And now. Come in through the nose. And out through the mouth. You can't focus filling that belly up like babies breathe. Then out through the chest, out through the mouth. Push that all the way out. We'll go three more. Come in. And out. Last one. Cool. Appreciate y'all. Another act of rebellion. Now we're sitting and talking about our feelings and we just breathe together. That's number two for the day. Well done, man. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate you leading that, brother. All right, y'all. Peace. I'm here behind the scenes. Be well. Do y'all thing. Appreciate y'all. We'll be back in a little bit. Take care. Good luck, guys. Thank you both. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Page. I'm the Senior Director of Na National Programs from Men Can Stop Rape here in Washington, DC. Um, today is our sixth rendition, our num conversation number six um, for our Healthy Masculinity, our National Healthy Masculinity Conversation Series. Um, today, uh, we will have a conversation with um, some gentlemen that are, are in different states that are doing the work around healthy masculinity and, and keeping our community safe and making sure that we're all um, informed in regards to our mission and vision to, to end violence, uh, specifically violence against women um, and gender-based violence. So today, we will um, be joined um, well, first of all, the conversation, the conversation's title is Changing the Code for Men and Boys in Our Communities. Um, and who, joining us today will be uh, Matt Tyler, um, Jeff Matizaka, Miguel Canares, Jalen Love, uh, and Derek McCoy. We also, uh, George Matos will not be joining us today, but we want to send a good, good shout out to him and his uh, colleagues at also. Um, and we look forward to this being a, a series of conversations. So we look forward to George joining us uh, in the near future. So before we begin, um, and, and the guys will check in and we actually uh, talk more about their actual roles in their organizations. Um, but before um, we start, I just wanted to really dig dig into a little bit to our organization, Men Can Stop Rape, Mixer for short, as you might hear us uh, uh, say during the conversation. Um, Men Can Stop Rape uh, started in 1997 as a volunteer organization here in Washington, DC. Um, uh, 
the, 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 the gentleman who started the organization um, is a volunteer collective and they saw the need uh, in community for men to be involved um, in pre violence prevention, specifically gender based violence and violence against women. So we wanted to, um, you know, as organization, uh, they volunteered and then became a official nonprofit uh, two years later. So just to give you a little background in regards to the healthy uh, HMAP, as we call the Healthy Masculinity Action Project. Um, the, collabor the collaboration with, uh, in collaboration with more than 40 organizations and agencies, uh, Mixer launched HMAP in 2012 to raise national visibility of healthy masculinity. Uh, Mixer will officially relaunch that actual uh, uh, HMAP uh, project in uh, 2022, and as we celebrate our 25th year anniversary. So uh, these gentlemen and their organizations uh, uh, will definitely be a part of that and uh, folks that are on, on the lines and that have been uh, with us through our, through our journey as an organization for this last 25 years. And just wanted to highlight um, our work, our community work and our youth development work. Um, as some of you are, are familiar with uh, our most club, Men of Strength Club, and our WISE Club, Women Inspiring Strength and Empowerment. Um, the Men of Strength Club has been uh, you know, operating um, under, the, under the guidance of our executive director, Neil Irvin, for 20 years now. And WISE um, was a creation from our young people, um, the, the young ladies in our middle and high schools here in DC um, that, that saw the model of the Most Club and, and made it their initiative um, and what we call community strength projects to, to create this club. So with um, their support and guidance as an organization, we, we started um, the WISE Club and now we're in a majority of the high schools working with young uh, girls um, here in Washington, DC. And we're looking to really expand that work nationally the same way we have the most club. So um, the middle the middle slide is just a little advertisement to our counter stories. Uh, it was a creation to come out of uh, our community strength projects um, that we focus on working with our youth. Um, and with that, you know, our community strength uh, is counter stories came about. It's an award winning uh, docu series um, that's created, um, produced, and you know, all different elements of the creation of counter stories came from our young men and women um, in our most and wise clubs here in Washington, D.C. So just want to give you some background, and uh, we're looking forward to today's conversation. Um, and uh, we just wanted to also uplift um, some hashtags, and you know, during this conversation. Please, uh, you know, tweet the questions at Men Can Stop Rape. Also, please use hashtags HM Series or hashtag Healthy Masculinity, or you can submit the questions and comments um, in the sec in this comment section in YouTube. So, uh, thank you all, um, and let's let's jump in our conversation and meet our participants. Good afternoon, fellas. You can unmute yourselves. I see. What's up, Jake? Hey, how's everybody doing? Good. Good, good, good. good. Hey. Well, I appreciate you joining. Um, like I mentioned, we are missing George, uh, but I appreciate you brothers a lot for joining us in this uh, sixth conversation that we're having as an organization. Um, this conversation actually, you know, as you all know, it came out of our um, our relationships um, in community, whether it's in Florida, um, Massachusetts, uh, there in Denver or Idaho, it came out of the relationships and it came out of the, the work that we all do across the board and actually helping each other um, in regards to our work and our, our, the way we engage community, specifically men around this work. So I just wanted to um, give you all space to actually introduce yourselves um, and your organizations, your role to organizations and give a little feedback around your organization and, and the work that you all do. And then after everyone shares, I would like to actually start with the check-in, something that we all traditionally do, no matter if we're in a, you know, a DOJ convening or, or what have you, we always check in and make sure that we're present with each other. So, and no, no specific order, fellas, um, who wants to um, start with their introductions? <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go ahead. Uh, Miguel, he, him, his. I am um, the program uh, director for the project. 
Aging Men and Boys program at the Center for Hope and Healing in Lowell, Massachusetts. Basically there I oversee the uh, men's programs um, for our barbershop. So we work with a local barbershop around masculinity, giving them the tools and tips that they can have um, so that they are able to have healthy uh, conversations with their clients, among other things. They also facilitate trainings for us in the community and we're hoping to continue to have a ripple effect um, in this five-year project that we have going on with them. I also oversee the projects that we're doing with the Mutual, Mutual Assistance Association program, um, where we run trainings for their staff and also for their after-school program um, with young people from sixth grade to about 12th. Um, and yeah, just doing a lot of sexual violence prevention work with them. And we also participate in programming with an organization called UTEC, um, which stands for United Teen Equality Center. They work with um, folks um, with, uh, you know, gang ties and, and, and young folks who have been high school dropouts, young parents, um, and they basically are considered proven risk. So these young people also participate in programming along with the staff also at UTEC to again be um, advocates in sexual violence prevention. Uh, along with all kinds of gender violence prevention. Um, and we do a lot of work with the colleges in the community as well. Um, so that's pretty much the gist of it. Thank you, Miguel. And great facilities you have up there with UTEC as well. Definitely looking forward to come visiting you all again. Who's next? I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for leading Men Can Stop Rape, as always. Uh, my name is Derek McCoy. I work for an organization in Denver, Colorado called Project PAVE. Um, one of my colleagues is on the line, too, so I'll let him introduce himself. Um, but ultimately, Project PAVE is a violence prevention and intervention program, and I am the violence prevention director. Um, even though we use that language, we take a strength-based approach to pro-social emotional learning. So um, as a career professional in this field, my goal is not to prevent violence, it's to promote healthy masculinity, healthy relationships um, of all sorts. So um, a little bit about our healthy masculinity program, we call it the True Man program. Um, we've been in partnership with the Denver Broncos here for going on five years, and um, we go with their futures football programs and these are middle school players paired with their high school coaches and we have conversations conduct activities um, to really reflect upon how we're taught to express and view masculinity um, and we look at some of those problematic pieces and, and challenge them uh, with regard to humanizing our emotions um, giving dignity and respect to feminine identities and gay identities, identities that are, are deeply marginalized um, and really pushing back on that sort of dominant narrative around masculinity um, with what men can stop rape would call the counter narrative. So um, getting exposed to all you folks around the nation has amplified our understanding of these issues and created this common language through the years. So my hat's off to everybody on the call and hopefully folks who are joining us today can, can kind of lean into the <clears throat> excuse me, to the common language use so that we can use simple language to um, adapt new practices and approaches to masculinity. So I'll pass the mic. Thank you, Derek. Thanks, D. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Jordan Love. He, him, his. I work with uh, Project PAVE as well. I'm a violence prevention specialist, which basically means I go out and I facilitate the workshops with her at, uh, either at the schools uh, or the outside organizations that we work with, uh, also promoting healthy relationships, uh, healthy uh, ways of regulating our emotions and just healthy uh, conversations around consent as well. So I'm happy to be here and thanks for joining. Appreciate you, Jalen. All right, I'll, <clears throat> I'll jump in there, hi. Matt Tyler, I'm down here in uh, South Florida, Palm Beach County, Florida with ABDA, which stands for Aid to Victims of Domestic Abuse. Uh, we're one of the certified domestic violence centers in Palm Beach County, and I'm a violence prevention educator. So we do community, professional, and prevention education. Uh, we work a lot in uh, multiple schools within the school district. Uh, we work with local colleges, Florida Atlantic University, as well as Palm Beach State, and um, our Commit to Change Prevention Initiative um, developed into what is our Committed Men campaign, which is our work to engage uh, men and boys in Palm Beach County uh, to prevent violence against women and girls. 
Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Uh, Jeff Matsushita, he, him, his. Uh, I've had the, the great fortune of being able to be joined in space with you all, but the vehicle to get there is through the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence uh, in Boise, Idaho. Uh, we you know, are state domestic and sexual violence coalition, but we're really made up of our programs around the state, um, our tribal and, and community-based domestic and sexual violence programs are why we exist. Uh, and then the other, and we exist to lift up community. And, and you know, Derek, you named some of those terms. We talk about the margins, you know, the, the most marginalized. Uh, so really, if we design our things, our programs, our our outcomes, uh, campaigns, to lift up the voices and experiences of those most marginalized. We center that, we're all good, right? And so that has really been a big shift for us at the, at the coalition in Idaho. Um, being, we call ourselves a mainstream org, and we've had the great fortune to be in relationship with community-based organizations, uh, folks in communities that, we, that I'm not a part of. Uh, so our project through OBW, the way I got to connect with y'all was through uh, the Engaging Latinx Men Project, uh, we're a grant recipient from OBW. And that's the first time in my, since I've been at the coalition, since 04, that we've been in really intentional with engaging the Latinx community in the neighboring county next door. Um, lifting up the voices, experiences, and centering women who experience men's violence, and also set, but really centering the experience for the men, right? Because we know that most men aren't going to perpetrate violence. So, this project has allowed us to be in community intentionally. Um, my co-facilitator, who uh, Estefania Mondragon, she is the heart of this project because she is a community member. She has trust and already relationships. So that's been a great dovetail for me to, to, to utilize my skills and that I've acquired. Um, but the trust is through her. And I think with us as men in this work, we're, I know I'm only here because women in my life, right? Women have been started this movement um, at the kitchen tables, you know, running the middle of the night with a pot of coffee. So this really feels like we're all sitting around a, a kitchen table and maybe it's chai tea, maybe it's coffee, however you get down, but we're gonna get back to these roots, you know, of where this movement started. And for us as men, it's time for us to get back to that kitchen table. So Jay, I really appreciate the invitation and you all co-signing on that we can just be on ourselves. You know, and, and, and connect that head to heart more so than it coming with this training agenda, you know, and check boxes. We're building relationships and we move at the speed of trust. So I've gotten these wonderful opportunities to connect with y'all and I look forward to this going forward. Love that. We move at the speed of trust. I appreciate that. Um, you all, that, that's an example of all you all here, um, the trust that we all developed in each other and the, the relationships. So I appreciate that, fellas. Um, yeah, so... I want to, you know, as I mentioned before we, you know, did our check, our formal check-ins, um, something that we always do when we're convening in our big convenings or, you know, we all just have individual conversations or our group check calls that we've been having the last month or so. Um, it's something called a check-in, right? Our organization really makes sure that we're intentional about checking in, um, whether it's staff meetings that we had this morning via Zoom um, or just talking to one another. Um, and it's about being present, right? It's about, you know, one of you all mentioned uh, the social emotional intelligence of the work we do, right? Social emotional learning. It's a big part of what we do. And it's kind of, it's, it's based on meeting people where they are, right? It, it's, it's being able to get into communities, engage communities, but first you got to meet them where they are and you got to be intentional about doing that. So before we move forward, I would just like to check in, um, give the audience and folks listening and tuning in an uh, example of what check-in is. I know all of our organizations do it in some type of variation, um, but how about we just check in with each other and make sure that we're all present and here in the moment. It was y'all, anybody want to start? If not, I'll, I'll start myself. I'll start, okay. Um, I'm doing well, I'm doing well, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited, I'll be totally honest, right? A um, little nervous, a little nervous. Uh, uh, just because, you know, the, the quote unquote new normal, I'm like, wow, I talk to these gentlemen all the time and we do the work and, um, you know, it, it was more of me just calming myself down and uh, being present, being in the moment. And I'm here, I am definitely am. Uh, I'm just, I'm excited uh, for everything going on 
uh, even though we're, we're in trying times right now, um, it seems as that things are getting better and talking to folks in different communities, folks are adjusting. So, you know, I just uh, wish everyone well, I'm present and I'm excited to really hear from you all and hold this conversation and uh, more excited for what's to come out of this conversation and more conversations with other, uh, other men uh, that we engage and uh, have, have partnerships and relationship with. So check in. I appreciate it, Jay. Um... Uh, I was stressing, like I gave myself the haircut last night. So for me, my home fades. I need about four or five <laughs> days for the fade to actually come through and the braids <laughs> makes it look like a fade. So that's, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm folded out of the oven a little quick. Uh, you know, and then I was struggling like, yo, do I give him the three quarter zip official Jeff or do I come in with a t-shirt cause I'm about to strip this thing off? Like which one do I show up in? So yeah, I was wrestling with that before the call. Uh, it really helped me feel grounded and centered that, that we all got time to chop it up a little bit. Um, and, and to see your faces, that has been the upside for me in this, uh, this our, you know, where we're at right now with the quarantine. I've never been this connected to men um, since there was a project about 10, 12 years ago. And uh, you know, other than that, it was four intentional times a year we got together. However, now I get to have, comp like Jay, you reached out the first week and we connected on the phone, you know, and then Miguel, I was able to actually make the time because I got it. I got no excuses. There ain't no commute, you know, none of that joke. We, we connected over the phone. Um, I, I feel the most connected I have with men because these Zoom calls, even though it's a, a close second, it's, it's, it's just been a great vehicle for me to check in. So I, I we do about three or four of these a week. Um, and that has helped me feel grounded and centered. And my partner a couple of weeks ago just mentioned, she's like, you seem, uh, you seem really happy and, and kind of easy going. And it, it, I know it was a question of love, but it was still a question. <laughs> it's like, what's going on? You know, what, what's, and I do believe there has been a sense for me of, I don't have to perform all the time. And I feel like when I go out into the world, I struggle with performance and imposter syndrome. So. This ability to, to see the vulnerability to see y'all's homes, offices, wherever you're at right now, there's a piece of you in the background and that's vulnerable. And I have really, really appreciated that vulnerability and the face-to-face, -face, but also the peek into some of your lives. And that has helped me be a little, a little more authentic and real. And so it's drawn my heart and my head to be connected. And I've, I've appreciated that out of this circumstance we're in um, that I can feel more connected with folks doing this work and not isolated. So that's where I'm at this week. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. And I'll check in later about the fade. I might need some tips. Man. I'll go ahead and jump in. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jason, for sharing. Um, <clears throat> we, we call this a vibe check based on a student that we work with at East High School. Um, but I have to give a shout out to a principal, Polly Beck, over at CEC Early College, who introduced us to this concept um, doing a check-in, and we've been doing it for about two, three years now, um, but the, the continuity is really what excites me. The fact that we're doing this around the states um, and, and we're all getting on the same page with that is, is really huge, and um, I piggyback Jeff and Jason with, you know, the excitement that I feel around that, but if I were to label how I truly feel is, is sort of ambivalent. <clears throat> I do feel excited to be connected to so many wonderful people, men and women, young people included, non-binary folks as well, who are, are changing the narrative about how we see ourselves as humans. Um, and I'm ambivalent because we are going through this, this serious crisis right now all together around the globe. And, and my heart goes out for all of those who have been furloughed, who have been laid off, who have job insecurity, who are uh, losing family members or dealing with illness. So uh, just a lot of prayers go out to folks. And I, I'm sort of like in the middle between struggling and feeling excited at the same time. So. I'm pretty ambivalent. Go ahead and pass the mic. Uh, I'll go ahead and go. <clears throat> uh, thanks, D and guys that came before me. Also, uh, we do the vibe check like Derek says, but yesterday I was on a training, so I'm going to go with a different approach. So one of my highs, uh, I'm going to do it from a high low uh, point of view. So one of my highs, I guess, would say just being able to be home here in Wichita, Kansas with family, being surrounded uh, by them during this difficult time. Uh, just being able to be connected 
with your family members, it always does something for me and I'm pretty sure other people out there uh, during these trying times and having those people that you can talk to and you can lean on is very important. I would say one of our lows or one of my lows would be an uh, individual that we work with at one of our uh, partner street fraternity that we are linked to with the OBW call. Uh, we lost one of our participants uh, this past weekend to some violence in their community. So my heart goes out to the street frat and his family uh, and just prayers and blessings on them uh, going forward. Thank you, Jalen. Well, check in. I uh, kind of want to share the sentiment of like Derek, Jeff. Um, I just appreciate actually being able to do this. I miss you guys. <laughs> you know, we used to be able to get together a couple times a year, you know, in, in settings and spend a couple of days together having these conversations and learning from each other. So I was excited that we got to do this. You know, as Jeff said, the, a couple of com conversations we had coming into this was just feels good to do. Um, personally, you know, I can be grateful that your family is healthy, you know, um, you're working, we're still able to do this, but there's some uncertainty, right? Cause not knowing there's no timeline to this, how long is this going on for? So that's kind of an anxious, you know, feeling to, to everything that's going on. Um, but overall, just a little bit of the nervousness as well with having this conversation on here and just hope I can add value. And I knew that this group of guys, um, I'm definitely going to learn something as well today. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Matt. Hey, y'all. So we typically check in at the Center for Hope and Healing by saying um, your name. So Miguel, he, him, his. And we use a feeling wheel, um, which has a bunch of words that's connected to other words. Um, so my word for today is is kind of anxious. Um, today was the first time in a while I was like, I miss basketball. <laughs> you know, like I really want to be on the court. And I think it's because... Things are stressful. I just had a conversation last night with my barbers and it was the first time they ever been on Zoom. It was the first time some of them had ever been on a laptop. Um, this barbershop that I work with closely works with a lot of young people, works with a lot of young people and also older people who have been incarcerated. Some of them have been incarcerated for 30 years, you know, and um, it's a blessing to be able to be part of their journey in healing um, and, it, and it costs a lot. And I think that a lot of times we are trying to do the opposite, right? Where we want to be vulnerable and role model vulnerable and not and not get caught up with it in the sense that we also have to have tough skin. And it's a it's a duality where it's 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 hard because you don't want to go too far, right? You want to be real about what you're feeling and where you are at. And and sometimes that can be taxing. And it's been taxing. It's been taxing. So I know that. Missing that basketball court is where I release a lot of energy and get a lot of joy. So I have to figure out what would be the other thing that I can replace it with. Um, NBA 2K has been great, but not the same. <laughs> um, so that's where I'm at. You know, I'm definitely thinking a lot about where we are in this country, what the messages that we're receiving, um, how that's landing on our people. And um, I, I think that one thing that I've realized is that there's a lot of trust issues in our communities around how do we best move forward. Um, so I'm glad that I'm part of what I feel like is like a dream team, to be honest with you. I really admire a lot of the people that are in this room. And I think they all individually know that because when we would be in these conferences and I would hear everybody speak, I would be like, man, I got to I gotta meet that person. I got to meet that person and connect with them and learn from them and, and all that. So, So that's where I'm at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I just want to point out, right, um, we call it check-in, um, but, you know, Jalen mentioned high-low, and, and Derek said, you know, the, the divide, what is the vibe check, I believe it was. Um, it looks many different ways, but the point is all that we're, we're seeing where each other are, right, and we're checking to make sure that we're all present, right, and I know um, some, some of you, you did mention, like me, being nervous or, or just uncertainty. Um, that's important when we're engaging community. Right. We can't go into somebody's community and just push this message on them and, and talk about healthy masculinity and what we need to be doing as men if we don't know where they are in the moment. Right. If we don't know if they're dealing, like Jalen said, with with death by someone in their community. Right. Or, or some of their family members being sick or the uncertainty of not having a job. Right. Or, or being able to have technology. So I appreciate you all. So 
I wanted to jump into the conversation, right? Um, Matt, you mentioned our check, our calls that we've been having, right? Right. And we were talking about this conversation and I was like, wow, what was the theme? What are we talking about? And as we were talking, I'm taking notes and I'm telling y'all I'm not being rude, but I'm taking notes because y'all were just giving me so much and we had so much uh, great conversation. And we all talked about, all of us were talking about our communities and how we engage men and, and that word code came about right? We all want to promote healthy masculinity. We all know that there's six men on this call right now, and there's six different definitions or, or healthy masculinity looks six different ways, right? But they're all connected. So when we talk about the code, right? My question to you all, right? Um, and I want to start out this way. When we talk about the code, what is that, right? Is it, a, is it a rite of passage? When we talk about a code and connection to healthy masculinity, what does that look like in, your, in Denver? What does that look like in Massachusetts? What does that look like for y'all? Can y'all speak on that? Yeah, the, um, the code is changing. And if I go back, um, I'll start off with like a little history uh, in my experience. Um, we often sort of criminalize or demonize individuals without asking them that question, well, what, what did you learn the expectation for masculinity is? What does your community expect from masculinity? Because if we ask that question, then we would see this is a collective issue more so than an individual, right? And us individuals might demonstrate problematic behavior. So the code when I was growing up was shut up with your emotions and fight with your fists and see her as an object for your consumption, right? Um, and that never really resonated with me, um, specific, specifically the see her as an object, right? And I know that's not the language that we use typically, um, but it, there is this low and high level pressure to conform to the objectification of female bodied people, um, to see them as objects for our consumption. So um, for me, I got really good at masking my emotions so that I would always be stoic, like a video game avatar, right? You see these characters in action films, murder and violence, war is happening all around them and they're just, right? No emotion on their face. And we're expected to kind of live up to that standard of you can be angry, you can be happy, but all these thousands of emotions in between pretend like those don't exist. So there's this dehumanization of masculine emotions uh, that is a part of the code and this expectation of being aggressive uh, sexually towards women and girls that creates a rape culture. So that code to me is what is transforming rapidly. And I see the younger generations taking on a consent culture and consent language that comes along with that and, and transforming that code to where men and boys are emotional beings as well. And rather than denying and suppressing and being ashamed of those emotions and having them morph into some uh, mental illness, addiction, relationship abuse, learning, how do I use my emotions? Why is jealousy something that is, is inside of me? And what do I do with that jealousy? Um, because all too often the code says, hold that person responsible for your emotions uh, as opposed to I'm accountable for my emotions. If, if Jalen disrespects me, I feel disrespected, but it's my emotions to deal with. I don't hold him accountable for how I feel. So the code transforming from see her as an object to see her as a human who shares your common emotions. And what do I do with these emotions? Because I'm accountable, what do I do? Why are all these emotions here? What can I do with them to enhance my existence and those around me? Thank you, Darren. Who else? We think about the code, you know, what does that mean and what does it look like? And, you know, how, how are we connecting that to healthy masculinity in our communities or how the young people and the men in our communities, you know, how do they see that? Yeah, I want to, um, some of the things that Derek mentioned uh, definitely resonates kind of locally in the community, but he was just talking about one, how we learn, like asking the question to young men, like, so how did you learn? These, these masculinity or what it is to be a man, right? So we do a lot of work around media and media literacy, right? So what is that message that you're taking in from your music, your movies, you know, all the social media and images and, and things like that that are now, especially in this time currently, how much are they spending seeing all of this visual media, music, how much of that are they taking in and how is that shaping their attitude, beliefs, behaviors about other people, individuals, groups of people, um, and where that really plays a role. Um, some of the things you hear is like that pressure of that dominant story to behave or act in a certain way, yeah. right? So 
um, you know, how that's reflected in their own relationships. Um, you know, some of it came back to like respect. So it's like, oh, I'm not going to be respected if I don't now challenge, you know, Jalen because Jalen just called me a name, right? So I'm going to be, I'm going to look a certain way or right. be looked at less than what is, you know, this dominant message. You know, the media really is the storytelling and, and shapes our culture, right? So, you know, how all of that plays a role. So we do a lot with the, with the media and understand that message. Um, I love the point, Matt, that you brought up, just asking the questions, right? Um, I think the first part of the code for me personally is like, well, first and foremost, we work with young people, we work with men, women, adults alike, professionals, but we work with young people. So first for me is like, well, how do we keep them safe, right? So it's like going into that conversation with keeping that in mind first, um, because we know that some of that dominant story stuff or some of the way they may handle situations is in their community maybe keeping them safe, right? We talk about vulnerability. I think we're all adult professionals that are working on ourselves. So it's easier for us to be vulnerable, right? But when we're talking about folks in different communities and, and, and young people, that vulnerability can be scary. So when we're, you know, I, I do want to um, ask you all, you know, I want to ask uh, Miguel and to, to answer that first question as well. But when we're, when we're addressing healthy masculinity, we're addressing how to, when we're engaging these men around this conversation, you know, what, what, what is it that's coming up? What is it that they're, they're saying in regards to their communities? You know, what is it that makes them care and, and be, you know, those credible messengers and able to move forward and uplift their community and the folks in their community, such as uh, yourselves? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for the group that I've been working with, a lot of it is they're tired of doing things the old way. I think they have, um, pay the price of living by the code. Mm -hmm. um, living by the code has um, created a lot of pain, has created a lot of strain, whether it's relationships that they don't have or wish they have with their children or um, marriages that, got been, that have been broken, um, you know, not having connections to their, their families, right? Their, their mom or their dad. Um, and also um, being incarcerated has has been impacted by following this code and they wanted to change um, the, a lot of those things and for some of them all of those things and I think that we have communities where we have a lot of young men who have a lot of barriers in front of them <clears throat> I mean we talk a lot about racism as if it's something that's in the past and the reality is COVID-19 is kind of exposing the reality of what our people of color in general are, are living like and 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 their, their hardships because um you know when you enter these conversations if you're in these communities you will clearly hear the stories um that are heart-wrenching you know we all can talk about probably five people very quickly that we know right um that are going through some really painful stuff um so to me that's why I think a lot of them are approaching this work and, and want to do this work. And a lot of them see their changes and now they want to be able to replicate that or be able to give somebody else that experience, um, which I think is awesome. Um, Cause the one thing about the neighborhoods that I work with and that we all with is that people from the outside may look at it as a dangerous place where a lot of um, crime happens. And in reality, there's so much love there. There's so much, other positive things going on there that people don't really highlight or see and that you don't get to see anymore on TV and the movies and, you know, everything has really shifted in my opinion, um, the way that they had um, been put, portrayed before, like in Poetic Justice or Jason's Lyric and movies of that nature that really portrayed some of the things that were going on in the community. And I'll end this by saying that um, we have been influenced very widely because fathers were missing. One of the things that ha happened with mass incarceration is when you went to a Thanksgiving um, celebration with your family, a lot of uncles and dads were missing. So the messages were being filled in by pimps and hustlers. The messages were being filled in by some of the movies like 21 Tana is a huge one, right? Where the guy really has this code of how he handled things and how he does things. And I think for a young person, that appealed to me. I wanted to be like that. I wanted to have that strength. I wanted to have that power. I wanted to have that presence. And that meant to me that I needed to carry myself the same way that he did. Ruthless, short, you know, don't let no one disrespect me. And 
really what that had created was more problems on top of the problems that I already had because I didn't know how to be a young man and I didn't know how to mature. Mm-hmm. I was trying to mature with no real serious direction because this is not something that schools cover either, you know, so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Miguel, you mentioned it, right? And I think uh, you mentioned a lot of love and there's a lot of compassion in these commun- in our communities um, that come kind of gets overlooked. And, I'm, and I know as an organization and as your organization as well, we take a strength-based approach, right? So, you know, working with young people and, and you know, you mentioned that they do want to change that code or they think they want to change their community. The first thing I do is, you know, I think, it, and we all do this, right? It is, is having those simple conversations and, and, and allowing them to teach us, right? I think the, the the best thing about being friends and colleagues with you all is that you're always teaching me, right? And as much as you all teach me, I get even more from the young people that I'm in, in relationship with and community with, right? And they're the ones that are are kind of getting away from that dominant story, right? But we know there's other always dominant stories evolving and, 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 and that are present. But um, when you talked about that that love and compassion, right? Um, that is that is a part of that changing the code, right? Change, trying to make sure we're uplifting those pieces. What are some other elements or part of this code that you all lift up and talk about and that some of your young people and men in the community have kind of pushed forward and um, that y'all kind of have been focusing on during your presentations or your, your daily work with uh, folks? Uh, one thing we like to use as Street Frat, uh, and we use it in our organization as well, is trust. And trust is really like a bowl of marbles, like the Brene Brown example. Uh, Say, for instance, if you have a bowl that's empty, what are some trustworthy things that you can do in order to build that relationship? So as you build that relationship and build that trust, the bowl continues to fill up. And I think that's very uh, important first when going out in the communities and uh, having these type of conversations, just so in order uh, for them to feel comfortable with us and us learn from them, I think it's very important that we try to uh, have that trust. Definitely. Others? Yeah, I appreciate all this. Miguel, you, you kind of sparked something for me of like, if you can see it, you can be it, right? I think we've done, as a parent, we have a almost 10 year old and uh, a six year old. Um, and for us in, for raising daughters, I think we've done a great job of seeing like, yo, you can be president, you, you can be, you know, the next prime minister, CEO, We've done a really, really great job of uplifting for young girls or female identified peoples of what's possible, right? And just to check the messaging, we go to, Matt, you mentioned social media or pop culture. I see all kinds of t-shirts of like girl power and, you know, Ms. Anything I Want to Be, damn it. You know, and all these like empowerment messages for female identified people, especially young girls, and we're raising them. Um, And this is, uh, I think, oh, the founder from Ms. Magazine. I'm blanking on her name. Oh, shoot. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly embarrassed that I cannot remember one of the, 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 the people that founded the movement of feminism. Um, oh, it's going to come to me. But she, she talks about the our work really is raising our sons as we would as human beings, right? We, we quote unquote, in the gender binary, we raise our girls as we would boys, but are we willing and am I able to, to raise our daughters as, or as our boys as we would girls? And again, getting out of the binary, but am I willing to raise this young boy to be a full human being and express their emotions that you talked about, Derek, right? Connecting head to heart um, and, and being a full experience. So uh, I think that, that, that as far as the using pop culture as the, the, the litmus test, we use a lot of J. Cole, um, his music, and we do this exercise where we print off the song lyrics and we, we do after our check-in, uh, we'll go through and read the lyrics just for the opportunity for everybody to put their voice in the space at least once. Um, and two of the songs that we use um, in our pregnancy prevention programming for young boys uh, the first one is Wet Dreams, when we talk about puberty, you know, and J. Cole is really transparent in the lyrics about fronting, right? But then behind the front, you get to see the vulnerability and how he lists out of his fear and ang- anxiousness around sex. Um, uh, and then the, the second song we use is Folding Clothes, right? This idea that there is this dual duality sometimes we perform, as Derek, you talked about the shield and, and bulking up before we go out. 
Um, and J. Cole talks about being at home with his partner and, and do, how good it feels to do things for them. Who's, they're pregnant, you know, folding laundry. And the benefits for the men is really illustrated with he eats a breakfast of raisin bran, almond milk, and a banana. And that it, even in the song lyric, J. Cole couldn't help but put in that quick shame plug of, yo, I did something good for me, but yo, you're soft. Right, that shame bug is so built in, even in the lyrics. You know, and then the song is broken off in the second part. It's about the man box, like right? with Tony Porter and the Cult of Man talk about the man box of putting your mask on before you go out the door. You know, every every conversation is a job interview. You know, for your survival. And and I think that that duality in that song is really goes back to kind of the code that you were talking about, Jay. And Esther Stoller, the, the director from Futures Without Violence said this, that, that we as men were permission seekers. So if I'm looking to you men for how to perform and y'all are showing up to my group and you are honest, you're willing to listen and you're, you're, you're vulnerable, boy, that gives me the permission to kind of follow in your footsteps, right? So I think for us, and we're in this middle child generation, again, another J. Cole song, how are we sharpening and becoming a give living into our leadership abilities? Uh, cause we're not the OGs, you know, we're not Neil Irvin and Tony Porter, Ted Bunch, Dick Bathrick, but we certainly, well, I don't know about y'all, but I'm not on, the, on, the, on my way up. I just made 42, about to be 43. So in this middle child generation, thank you, Derek, how are we going to live into this leadership piece? Right. And so yeah. the authenticity, the vulnerability, being able to be with you all and share, yeah. I think for us, we got to get ourselves heck, head and heart connected. Definitely. I'm going to go back. Gloria Steinem, idiot that I forgot her name. Gloria Steinem challenged us as community members to love and lift up our boys as we would full human beings. Definitely. Thank you. Definitely. And, and, and with that, Jeff, you know, you mentioned those characteristics. For me, it's about, you know, I always talk about consistency when I'm talking about young people, talking to, to, to people in, in, in our field. Um, it's consistency, but I think it's a, it's bigger than consistency. And it, I got this from speaking with you on our last call. It's intentionally cons being con intentionally consistent, right? Whether it is doing those things like reading between those notes or whether it is, um, you know, uh, lifting up though those counter stories, right? Lifting up uh, those, those songs and what, what J. Cole was doing. It's the consistency that's gonna have our, our have folks um, and men actually, you know, if we're present and we're consistently present and we're consistently having these conversations with that honesty and that trust, you know, they're gonna buy in and they're gonna see also, well, you know what? They are credible messages and they're learning from us. And I think that that's, that's a key element to it as well. And I also just, Chime in that <clears throat> something that you said, Jeff, reminded me of um, this person named Dr. Bettina Love, who um, is a professor at the, I, I think at, at Georgia University. And um, she talks about how a lot of teachers don't see the intelligence in our young people that are in the hip hop culture. Um, one, teaching them geometry when their hair, a lot of times when they braid it, there's a lot of geometry there, but that's never used as an example and how they teach and how we do conflict resolution every single time we step out of our doorstep. Every single time we step out of our doorstep, we already know what streets we shouldn't cross, what colors we shouldn't wear, um, what to do if we see certain people, what to do if police drives by, right? Like there's so much that I think people forget that it's not just about us changing people, but we also simultaneously have to change the conditions of our communities. There is a behavior that is being displayed by our young people and by our uh, adults as a product of the environment. And yes, I do believe that you can still shape someone to be great and have really strong integrity, which I think at the end of the day is really what we need to build, right? Being yourself no matter where you are, whether people are looking or not. Um, but also having the piece of there needs to also be help outside of our power, right? Like how do the drugs come into the community? How do the guns come into the community? Why do we have poor schools? Why is it that now during COVID-19, we can give everybody a lump sum of money to get them above water, right? So there are so many things that I think that is also out of our control, 
but that we can, as a collective unit, influence, whether it's through voting or whatever it is that we need to do together. Um, but there is also a, a separate change that needs to happen in the community that we can do with each person, but our government and our systems, the way that they're created, also need to be changing um, in order for us to be able to be completely successful and get everybody out of this hole that we're in. Yeah. Oh, I mean, the word that popped into my mind while you were talking to go is trauma, right? I think our communities are dealing with a lot of trauma, right? We could talk about now during this COVID-19 season, right? But before this, a lot of trauma. And I think that it's having those conversations and being trauma-informed, uh, having our men and young men alike actually being comfortable with, with knowing that some of the things they experienced might have been traumatic and having those resources for them um, so they can learn how to actually cope with that, right? So um, that 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 struck a, a you know that struck a bell to me, Miguel, when you were talking. Derek, I know you. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in, um, and and the trauma piece really connects to it as well. Um, but going back a few questions, Jason, you asked um, basically how how do we challenge young men to transform their expression of masculinity when that expression might be just keeping them safe in their community, right? Um, so I go to the collective social norming, right? What we think everybody's doing and thinking versus, versus what, like, what we would ideally be thinking and doing, right? Um, so I've seen that organizations um, on this call have been able to get groups of men together, groups of boys together, groups of boys and men together. There's a lot of power within that, that group dialogue. And, and Miguel, shout out to you for sending us um, the, the feminist on cell block Y. Um, I urge you all to check that out. It's on, it's on YouTube. Um, you see these men in a prison who are in a group having this collective dialogue um, to where they can really um, determine how this problematic narrative impacted them. So we actually took um, an activity from Men Can Stop Rape and have adapted it through the years for our program, uh, the Realist Man Activity. And um, basically what we do in a football setting, and, I, and that's our, kind of our group setting where uh, we start to have this collective conversation with coaches and with boys. Um, but we do this realist man activity, which we ask them to rank this man above that man, basically. Uh, you know, famous folks, Jay-Z and Nas, these kind of people. Um, Colin Kaepernick and Patrick Mahomes, Bill Gates and Donald Trump. We ask them to rank each man like as far as who would they would consider the realist but we say hey don't say anything about that other man just tell us why you think this man is the realist and one of the interesting outcomes of this is all of the qualities and characteristics that they value in this man that they're ranking um, are really human qualities um, you generally don't see has a lot of women has a lot of money but more like does what he believes in is willing to stake a stand sacrificed uh, for the better good, these kind of things. And then we have all these, these characteristics across the board and we'll wipe away the realest man off the board and say, do any of the women and girls in your life live up to these characteristics? And the answer is always collectively, yes. It doesn't matter if I'm in conservative bill or liberal bill. Um, what's being demonstrated is that what's inside of male-bodied people is actually human values. But transforming that narrative so that we have safety to express those values, right? So having that collective conversation, you realize like, oh, the collective social norm is not the dominant narrative. We actually value our emotions and Kendrick Lamar for expressing his emotions and, and promoting that. And, and to see that, it, it really amplifies that we can humanize masculinity to y'all's point. And in humanized masculinity, we realize that these characters and values are just human values. There's not necessarily a binary and you can fit in your uniqueness as a human, your authentic integral self and, and be unique and still human because there's a broader access to our expression of humanity. Definitely, thank you, thank you. Now, man, I, I just got the word. We only have 10 minutes left, guys. And, um, I, you know, we discuss, you know, allowing the audience and allowing folks that are viewing to actually ask us some questions. Um, you know, like I mentioned, this is what we feel is like the first of many different conversations with many different themes. Um, so Will Harris, my colleague, has uh, joined us because um, he's been kind of keeping his eye out for any questions or comments on uh, all of our social media platforms and YouTube. So, Will, um, you know, would you definitely go ahead and move forward with asking the fellas some questions from our audience? Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. So the first question we got from Graham 
via Twitter. Graham is from Scotland, um, and he wanted to know what um, what other ways this particular moment as it relates to COVID has um, exposed um, issues as, as far as it relates to the system and also potential ways that we can continue to support our communities as it relates to specifically working with uh, men and boys. Anyone wanna, wanna start with that? Anyone wanna address that question from our friend in Scotland? I'll chime in. Thanks for joining from Scotland, by the way. It's cool that yeah. you're all around the world. Um, so ultimately, I think that this this pandemic is exposing the reality that, you know, who is valued in our society and who is not. Um, and back to Miguel's point, when you have layers of marginalization, marginalization being here's the center of power, those who are pushed outside of that center of power, right? Those who are on the margins of our society, um, you know, people of color, historically, um, people who have been enslaved, women, girls, LGBTQ folks, right? Um, refugees and immigrants. Um, I think that this pandemic has really hyper exposed the reality that like our society doesn't value whole demographics of people. They're under resourced. And right now there's all of these great organizations that are coming together around Denver and Colorado to make sure that we're getting food and, you know, rent assistance to these folks. Um, but the reality is, should we not have those basic needs met? Should there be a universal basic income? So I'll cut off with that point. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. that, man. There's something that sparked for me is um, in a conversation I've been on uh, with Quentin Walcott's Connect NYC group was like coming out of this, like normal wasn't working for most of us. And you mentioned those communities who've been margins, marginalized. Yeah, they're, they're quote unquote, get back to normal. Well, shoot, normal wasn't great for a lot of people. So why are we trying to go back to that model? Um, so the mind frame we've had is like, when we come out of this, what are habits that we can, what are some practices, excuse me, that we could continue to do? I look forward to continuing with you all in this Zoom form or fashion, right? Yeah, we'll get together when we come through with OVW trainings can be in, in person. However, the in-between times are some things that we can build practices about accountability, and then working together in that check-in question, just to be authentic and, and accountable with you all. Um, so I think that's one of these practices that we can go forward coming out of this, is that we can bring that connection for men because we've been isolated before this and the isolation that we have to go to perform masculinity. Uh, there was a trainer from a call to men, she said, performing masculinity is a trauma response. Boy, that really, really resonated. So I'm done with, I'm, I'm done responding to that trauma, I'm gonna practice being in community with y'all. So that's one of the, those things that I wanna keep doing out of this is Zoom calls. Great. Anyone else before Will's next question? Um, I think that just to Jeff's point, like this check-in can be something that people start to do in their houses. I mean, I Definitely. do it with my family and I might be short on occasion and I'll just be accountable and say, hey, you didn't deserve me being short with you. I apologize for that right there. So I agree with Jeff. Great, thank you all. So the next question, um, funnily, is from Derek to Derek. Derek is from Chicago, and he and you mentioned working with the Broncos. And Derek wants to know, if, um, Derek, if you can share any more information around how to get um, leagues or organizations, specifically around like sports, more involved in um, some of the work and efforts that we're doing to engage boys and men. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the same thing with professional sports as it is with partnering with the school or a school district, right? You have to get those individuals that are, are already in that organization and are willing to champion that for you, that are able to sell that to whoever's in power at the organization if they're not that person, be it a teacher or all the community workers that work for pro sports teams. There's some phenomenal individuals in all of the sports, uh, whether it be college or, or professional sports, who are doing great community work. If you can get access to them and help them see what's behind your mission and how if they join that mission, they will have a greater societal impact. And that's one of the Denver Broncos values. Um, and, and I really hope that other organizations will, will see that influence and kind of take some of that lead because every single one of you is in, in cities or states that has professional sports or at least neighboring uh, states to where there's professional sports. Um, looking at you there, Jeff, in Idaho. Um, but ultimately, there is a lot of leverage as far as using their platform and your expertise to make a societal level impact. 
Definitely, Derek. And I think, you know, really engaging them around their leadership already, right? Using sports to propel the leadership, not just on the field, but, you know, they're credible messengers. You know, I know through Mixer's work, we're working with University of Maryland and their football program, uh, starting when Ralph Friesian was coach, you know, the way that Neil engaged him was around, you know, this will improve your program. Right. This will bring a different element to your program um, and bring that raise awareness around the leadership that is in the building that can be expressed other than on Saturdays on the football field. And I know um, being a former student athlete and Derek, we've talked about it before. It's just, you know, it is a it is a great tool and it's and it's it is capturing those what you talked about, the low hanging fruit, because there are people in those buildings that that do care about our mission and vision um, and sometimes just need the language or to hear, you know, hear what it is and that consistency then follows and we able to engage appropriately uh, and make some impact. Absolutely. Now, these organizations would rather have former athletes like us on the call doing this work than having a domestic violence case or committing suicide, right? So I have unfortunately way too many former teammates and friends who have taken their own life post-sport as well. So education and advocacy has real power to you know keep lives alive and in healthy relationships and then bolster the the reputation of these organizations that we represent definitely goes back to just keeping everyone safe will that uh, we have maybe time for maybe two more questions yeah we have one more um so this is from andres he's from philadelphia he wants to know um this is for anybody um are there any groups or projects that you're working with as it relates to engaging men and boys who may be returning citizens or who may already be um, in the prison system. Who wants to start? I know Miguel, uh, Derek, I know we all have some history with that. Yeah, so, so unfortunately, and this is why I think grants can be very tricky. <laughs> we are not allowed through the grant that we have to work with perpetrators. Um, or anyone who has uh, committed a sex crime, from my understanding, right? Um, so that limits sometimes a lot of what we can do. Um, however, what we have decided to do with the organization UTEC, who does do a lot of work behind the wall, um, so they do go to the prisons and they talk to young people and they help them set up their plan for when they are released. And then they usually immediately go right into UTEC, which serves young people age 17 to 25. So we do have a couple of young men who um, get trained through their staff member that I'm training. Um, and actually that, that Men Can Stop Rape has been training. <laughs> so, so we had a two day training where a couple of the street workers from, from UTEC were present um, and their staff. And then they're basically taking their learning like the uh, activity that Derek was just talking about around the real man. And then they are doing that in circle formats that they have in the prisons when they go and visit and do their work there. So that's one way that, that we're, that we're doing that. Yeah. And same here. You know, I think um, I give a shout out to our executive director, Neil Urban. He uh, built a relationship with the folks at the DC jails, um, working with specifically those young men who are about to transfer out, um, into, you know, there's still that age where they can be in juvenile system or, or uh, the adult prison or jail. Um, and for him, we started making those uh, relationships and building those relationships. And it was important to work with the inmates, but he also really made it stress the point that we need to work with the folks in the jail, right? The folk, these, the men and women that they're communicating with every day, right? Um, we know we we know we think of horror stories in jail, which is which is sometimes the case. But a lot of these you know uh, these officers that are working in the jails have influence over the, these guards or have influence over these inmates. Um, so for us, it was engaging them um, so they can kind of change that narrative and change the language they might be using and invite and, and kind of incorporate some different conversation with these young men that can not only keep them safe, but then to start thinking about that transition back into the society. Um, and, and it's funny that question will, because you know, one of the conversations that we're looking to really get into and have in community is the healing and what that looks like, right? And I think it, we need as, as, as men doing this work, we need space to work with um, not only potential perpetrators, but perpetrators, because at the end of the day, they're coming home back, back to our communities, right? And we want them to understand that they, serve their debt to society, now how can they possibly re-enter society and be transform themselves into being leaders 
and, and really, really understand how their community changed so their community can understand how they have changed. So, you know, that, that, that was a great question. And that kind of uh, builds off and makes me think, you know, we need to have that conversation around healing uh, sooner than later. So thank you, Will. Um, I know it's a little bit after three. Um, I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, you starting with you guys and all of our uh, folks watching and uh, that have checked in with us. Um, I thank you um, as, as an organization. Men Can Stop Break thanks you all um, for your time. Uh, we thank you for just the relationships that we have with you and your organizations. Uh, we thank you for the work that you do in community. And um, I just truly, from the bottom of my heart, appreciate you all. Um, and I'm happy that we were able to share these conversations that we all have normally together with others and kind of, like Derek said, promote these conversations and promote you know people across the country, specifically in this time, to have these conversations, but not put, use this time to be better coming out of this COVID time as well, right? We don't want to just check in with folks and, 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 and be empathetic and, and compassionate during this time. To me, it's more important to how we learn now to do that after. Right when we go back to our normal and make this and these convenings and these conversations normal. So before I go, I want to leave it to you, any of y'all. If y'all like any parting comments or you know want to say anything about what y'all have going on with your organization before we get out of here. Yeah, I was just going to chime in and say, um, you know, with regard to working with folks who are perpetrators of, of violence, um, that, that amplifies a huge gap in, in our societal level services. We're really victim centric, um, which we're going to need victim services. No shame to that. But what if we're working with folks so that we create less victimization, right? Um, so I was just going to say, Project Pay, we do some juvenile diversions work here and there. Um, but ultimately, um, there's other men around our, our state and our city who we've been connected with. And I just want to shout out Jason Vitello at Denver Health. Um, we got a collaborate of men who basically we just lean on each other's strengths. PAVE is not a you know one size fit all organization. So when it comes to serving different populations that we don't serve, we're connected to those that do. And I think that's a wise approach for all organizations as well. And just thank you so much, Jason, for your leadership. Uh, Matt, Miguel, Jeff, Jalen, thank you so much for being on here today. And thank you all for viewing. Much love to you all. Thank you, brother. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, 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 to plant a seed out there. Um, one of the things that I feel um, that hasn't been talked about is the need of men of color in this work, um, in the sense of counselors. Um, we at the Center for Open Healing um, have counselors. We, we are a rape crisis center, so we work with survivors of sexual violence. Um, and one of the challenges that we have, and, and we're actually working towards, so I'm super excited that we just received a grant to be able to um, hire a counselor and, and create more support for men. But generally speaking, throughout the state of Massachusetts, I can speak for, it's very hard for our men of color who are coming to these programs and who are participating in all of our activities to, when they finally get to the point of wanting to talk to a counselor, there's no one available that identifies with them. And then it kind of keeps them stuck. So planting seeds, like we need to build this, right? Somehow, some way. Definitely. Appreciate that, Miguel. I want to do lift up your barber work. You're spawning seeds in Idaho now. And the barbers we've been talking to, they, they see themselves as healers. And they're doing things that healers do. They were connecting their physical touch, their counseling. And they're also doing it. It's not face to face. They got back of the head. So I'm a lot more comfortable divulging all to my therapist who's behind me clipping me up. Right? Because if I feel good, I'm going to stand up a little straighter. And I get to unload, you know, some of those things without looking direct eye to eye contact the way a lot of male bodies have been socialized. So your work in, in Matt and Lowell, man, that's that's healing work. Uh, and I appreciate that. I do want to lift up the connection piece. So at a call to men, they're doing these biweekly conversations where people can just connect. I think that for me, that's helped me get some practice to see how they do people do it and then put it into practice. And I've had to be willing to fail. Uh, I invited 12 men who I've known for some of them two years, others 20, to get on to do these Zoom calls. And I'll tell you, I, I felt like a 12-year-old kid when nobody was showing up to my birthday party the first time. Like, shoot, nobody's coming. They don't like me. But they showed up. I had to be willing to fail and put myself out there. Vulnerability and model that failure, which on the scale of things was really small. But for us as men, like you said, Jay, practicing together to come out of this head, heart, connected, 
uh, and Derek lifting up those voices who've been marginalized to lean on one another and not continue for us as men to keep leaning on women in our lives for that emotional support. Adrian Marie Brown said this last summer in her blog post in June, she's tired. And so for us as men, we're back at the kitchen table now, but we need, I believe, leaning on y'all for emotional support. So my partner is not the one that has to do my healing for me, right? It's, it's my work. Trauma is not my fault, but healing is my responsibility. So I appreciate you, everybody joining in on this and we all can heal together. And I look forward to that. Thank you, Jeff. Can I, <clears throat> I just want to add on to that. Like Miguel, um, I work with some incredible men of color down here in Palm Beach County and they're doing a lot of work around racial equity. So I do want to speak to those uh, white identified individuals who are doing the work is that just the same way we need to listen to the women in our lives as a white identified male, my experience is not the same as a, a man of color, right? So we also need to be intentional about educating ourselves if we're gonna work in those communities and listening and learning from them as well. Matt, I just wanna say, you, I, I know what you're doing down there in Florida. I've been down there and just continue to lead because it, it was amazing to see you do so and hold, hold folks accountable, right? Not only just white men, hold men accountable. So I, I appreciate you, Matt. Looking forward to coming down to Florida again, too. And I just want to say thank you to all of you and all the viewers, uh, especially you men on this call. I'm the young pup, and I ain't been doing this work this long. So whenever whenever I'm able to connect with you guys, I learn so much, and I sit here and take notes. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for spreading your knowledge with me. I really greatly appreciate it. and hope everybody's staying safe and staying well. Uh, we appreciate you, Jalen, and uh, uh, I appreciate just having a conversation with you as well. Because you know, I used to be the young guy on the, on the calls and in the room, um, not that young anymore. So um, learning from you and hearing your voice and and making sure that I'm, you know, my colleagues Will and Jeremy and yourself are, are three men that I look at to make sure that I'm in tune with what was really going on in that generation that's right under me. So. Brothers, thank you so much. Uh, I'll, I'll be y'all know I'll be checking in with y'all soon, um, and uh, I hope to have another uh, conversation like this with you all and other colleagues uh, very soon. So thank you all for your work. Um, tell all your your colleagues that I know, and I'll, you know, send our love uh, to you know to out there in to Denver, Idaho, Lowell, Mass, and uh, West Palm Beach. And we thank you so much. And please tell your families and keep your families safe, and y'all keep safe, and and uh, let let let's do this again soon. Thank you all. Thanks, y'all. Bye.